Well, thank you. It's a singular honor for me to be here before all of you. I know the hour is late, and uh, I will try not to put you to sleep. Uh, I assure you that uh, the topic is one which is quite gripping. Uh, uh, provost, uh, me? Yeah. Ah. Uh, well, the Provost, Dean uh, Norma Bushard, uh, uh, and Professor Farid Abdul Noor, and Mrs. Chinye Hosla. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. It's uh, really a wonderful time in the relationship between India and the United States, and uh, I would very much welcome, after my talk, if we could have some round of questions from all of you. And uh, I must take this time off to also thank Akshay Potatil, uh, very good friend of mine, uh, who for introducing me to all of you and leading me here. In the history of India-US relations, there has never been a more fortuitous convergence of strategic, geopolitical, and economic interests of our two countries as at present. Our countries share a commitment to advance mutual prosperity, global peace, and stability. Our deepening strategic partnership is rooted in shared values of freedom, democracy, universal values, rule of law, tolerance, pluralism, and equal opportunities for all citizens. In his first India policy speech, the first major India policy speech delivered last month at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said that the U.S. is India's reliable partner at the world stage in this period of uncertainty and angst. This year marks the 70th anniversary of relations between our two countries. When President Truman welcomed then Prime Minister Nehru on his visit to Washington, he said, and I quote, destiny willed that our country should have been discovered in the search for a new route to yours, unquote. The Pacific and Indian Oceans have linked our nations for centuries. Francis Scott Key wrote what would become the U.S. national anthem while sitting aboard the HMS Minden, a ship that was built in India. Prime Minister Modi and President Trump are committed to building an ambitious partnership that benefits not only our two great democracies, but other sovereign nations working towards greater peace and stability. India and the United States reaffirmed their support for a reformed United Nations Security Council with India as a permanent member. Both sides are committed to ensuring that the Security Council continues to play an effective role in maintaining international peace and security as envisioned in the UN Charter. Earlier this year, instructors from the US and Indian armies came together to build a UN peacekeeping capacity among African partners, a program that we hope we will continue to keep expanding. This is a great example of how the United States and India are building security capacity and promoting peace in third countries and serving together as anchors of peace in a very tumultuous world. Our defense ties are growing. In line with our commitment to protecting international security and the defense of our people, our militaries conduct joint exercises. This year's Malabar exercise was the most complex to date. The largest vessels from the American, Indian, and Japanese navies demonstrated their power together in the Indian Ocean for the first time, setting a clear example of the combined strength of the three Indo-Pacific democracies. We hope to add others in coming years. In keeping with India's status as a major defense partner, a status overwhelmingly endorsed last year by the US Congress, and our mutual interest in expanding maritime cooperation, the Trump administration has offered a menu of defense options for India's consideration, including the Guardian UAV. In their bid to encourage industrial partnerships between our defense companies, Boeing and Lockheed are considering assembly of F-16 and F-18 aircraft in India. The fact that the Indian Navy was the first overseas user of the P-8 maritime surveillance aircraft, which it effectively fields with US Navy counterparts, speaks volumes of our shared maritime interests and our need to enhance interoperability. We imported $18 billion worth of defense equipment from the United States last year. The scourge of terrorism and the disorder sown by cyber attacks threaten peace everywhere. 
Over the past decade, our counterterrorism cooperation has expanded significantly. Thousands of Indian security personnel have trained with American counterparts to enhance their capacity. The United States and India are cross-screening known and suspected terrorists, and later this year, we will convene a new dialogue on terrorist designations. In July, the US designated Pakistan's Hezbol Mujahideen as a foreign terrorist organization, a long-standing demand of India. It is our shared belief that states that use terror as an instrument of policy will only see their international reputation and standing diminish. It is the obligation, not the choice, of every civilized nation to combat the scourge of terrorism. We are cooperating in cybersecurity and in homeland and border security. We are also expanding cooperation on issues like maritime domain awareness, humanitarian assistance, and disaster relief. India and the USA are the world's two largest democracies. The driving force of our close relationship rests in the ties between our peoples, our citizens, business leaders, innovators, and scientists. Nearly 1.2 million Americans visited India last year. More than 166,000 Indian students, some of whom are here, are studying in the United States. And nearly 4 million Indian Americans call the United States home contributing to their communities as doctors, engineers, and innovators, and proudly serving their country in uniform. As our economies grow closer, we find more opportunities for prosperity for our people. More than 600 American companies operate in India. U.S. foreign direct investment has jumped up by 500% in the past two years alone. And last year, our bilateral trade hit a record of roughly $115 billion. The announcement of the first Global Entrepreneurship Summit ever to be hosted in South Asia to take place in Hyderabad next month is a clear example of how we are joining hands to promote innovation, expand job opportunities, and find new ways to strengthen both our economies. Both sides are committed to deepening and widening bilateral cooperation to further this partnership. By 2020, India will emerge as the youngest country with an average age of 29. To achieve swift growth with equity and position ourselves among developed economies in the next 15 years, we need to quadruple our per capita income through sustained double-digit growth over this period. New technologies, capital, products, organizational and management skills are needed to provide a strong impetus to economic development. It makes perfect sense for India and the US as two democracies with shared values to build a strong foundation for cooperation in these areas of growth, not just for the next decade, but for the next 100 years. Economic growth flows from innovative ideas. Fortunately, there are no two countries that encourage innovation better than the United States and India. The exchange of technologies and ideas between Bangalore and Silicon Valley is changing the world. Prosperity in the 21st century and beyond will depend on nimble problem solving that harnesses the power of markets and emerging innovations in the Indo-Pacific. This is where the United States and India have a tremendous competitive, competitive advantage. To bring the benefits of development to those at the bottom of the pyramid, we need to increase the share of manufacturing in GDP. We are at 16% compared with 45% for China. In the first stage, our target is to increase from 16 to 25% by 2022. This will require large investments, and we hope to get a significant proportion of it from foreign direct investment. The Make in India initiative seeks to attract investment into manufacturing by introducing a business-friendly regulatory environment, fostering innovation, enhancing skill development, protecting IPRs, and building the best in-class manufacturing infrastructure. We have jumped 42 points in ease of doing business rankings in the last three years. We are now at 100, and we hope soon to reach Prime Minister Modi's target of 50. We have initiated reforms to simplify, rationalize, and amalgamate existing labor laws, reduced corporate and other taxes, implemented a new goods and services tax that will subsume several central and state taxes, passed a new bankruptcy law, and created Invest India to guide, assist, and handhold investors during the entire life cycle of a business. 25 sectors have been identified as priorities, including automobiles and components, connectivity infrastructure, defense, food processing, renewable energy, thermal power, electronics, and space. 92% of the sectors now permit 100% foreign ownership 
of the companies established in India. General Electric and Alstom are building factories for producing diesel and electric locomotives. Contracts for major infrastructure projects are on global tender basis. We will require about $1.5 trillion to upgrade and build new infrastructure over the next decade, of which we hope to get a significant fraction through the PPP mode. Increase in manufacturing will see an increase in jobs. We have 12 million young people emerging from universities and colleges every year. Major corporates are not happy with the skill sets of a majority of our graduates. Skill India seeks to train college students to equip them for jobs with higher competency levels. This is especially necessary as machines on the shop floor take over routine and repetitive assembly systems. Corporates which have in-house training as well as specialized training institutions, universities and academics from the United States have an opportunity to participate in Skill India. The costs of training can be held down by training local trainers who will disseminate to the mass of people. Online courses make it possible to reach a wider audience at low cost. To provide affordable housing and world-class amenities to those employed in the new factories, a hundred smart cities are being built on either brown or greenfield basis. These cities will have affordable housing, smart metering and power grids, water supply, sewage treatment plants, efficient transportation, health care, schools and colleges, shopping malls, parks and recreation areas. Those employed in the new manufacturing centers will live a better quality of life and the load on our mega metropolises like Mumbai and Delhi will be reduced. We are also putting in place huge infrastructure investments for sewage treatment and water purification as well as waste recycling. This again is a huge opportunity for US firms. To power these cities, apart from conventional energy sources, we have an ambitious target of 100,000 megawatts solar and 75,000 megawatts of wind and biomass power. Here again is the business opportunity for US energy companies in increasing installed capacities, improving energy efficiencies, and bringing in new and innovative technologies. US support to India in energy and climate change includes expanding partnership to advance clean energy research, PACE R, covering solar energy, building energy efficiency and biofuels, including financing, launching air quality cooperation and partnership on climate resilience. We are working with the US on adopting HELE, high efficiency, low emissions technology for coal. We have planned nuclear power plants with the US, French and Japanese companies. India began imports of shale gas from Texas in June this year. The Binational Indo-US Science and Technology Forum has played a successful role in catalyzing and supporting the current level of the multifaceted S&T relationship, advancing cooperation in the fields of science and technology and innovation, and empowering women to pursue careers in the STEM fields. India and the US are collaborating in high energy physics and cosmology, including the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, which detects the most cataclysmic events in the universe. We are also involved in the 30 meter telescope project and NASA and ISRO are collaborating on aspects of the moon and Mars missions. In February this year, India launched 104 satellites in one PSLV rocket. 96 of these satellites were from the US. 88 were from San Francisco based company. In medicine, there is collaboration in infectious diseases and the global sec health security agenda on cancer and diabetes research, prevention, control and management, detection and treatment of tuberculosis, combating multi-drug resistant TB, vaccines for TB, dengue and respiratory syncytical virus, RSV. India has the highest passenger traffic growth rate in the world in the civil aviation sector. Estimates are that we will need about 1,700 passenger jet aircraft over the next 20 years. We are building new airports. We have only 75 airports at the present, but we want to reactivate 350 unused airstrips. The investment in airport infrastructure and aviation services is expected to be around 120 billion. In addition, Maintenance, repair, and overhauling business in India is a business opportunity for investors like Boeing, since it can handle not only the overhauling of aircraft operated by Boeing, which is currently serviced abroad, but also of aircraft all around the Asian region. The automotive sector, which contributes 7% to the GDP, is the lar third largest market globally. India has announced that all cars sold after 2030 will be electrics. We hope to foster adoption of hybrid and electric ve vehicles, and encourage their manufacturing in India through demand and supply side incentives and promoting battery technologies and charging infrastructure. 
we have provided several tax and other incentives to startup companies. Digital India is leveraging the internet to make available bank accounts through mobile phones. We have over 1 billion mobile phones now, of which nearly, nearly 300, bil 300 million are smartphones. India's Aadhaar, a 12-digit unique identification number, is the world's largest exercise in biometrics, benefiting 1.2 billion people so far. Over 250 million bank accounts, many with zero balances, have been opened in India, uh, which use Aadhaar for identification and a mobile phone for depositing money. Extending this, Aadhaar has now been made mandatory for all bank accounts and even mobile phone SIM cards. Under Digital India, we are connecting 250,000 village clusters through fiber optic cable across India. In partnership with Google, Wi-Fi hotspots have been set up in 400 railway stations and also on running trains. Facebook and WhatsApp are providing last mile connectivity to individual houses. The e-commerce industry is expected to reach 120 billion by 2020 and we are likely to have 100 million online shoppers by the end of this year. The real-time availability of services on mobile phones and online platforms enables electronic and cashless transactions, so many Indians are leapfrogging from cash to digital payments without ever having to use a plastic credit card. E-commerce is cutting out the middlemen and reducing corruption and enabling weavers, farmers, and craftsmen to market their produce directly. Indians can keep copies of their passports, land records, and birth certificates in a digital locker, access cloud storage for weather and other information, and receive alerts regarding impending natural disasters. U.S. corporates in the medical industry space are seeing value in developing cost-cutting, cost-effective ECG and diagnostic machines and medical equipment in India. India's retail market of over 600 billion is gradually being opened up to outside investment. 51% foreign direct investment is permitted in multi-brand retail with back-end infrastructure investment towards processing, manufacturing, design improvement, quality control, packaging, logistics, storage, warehouse, and agricultural market produce infrastructure. Less than 10% of Indian food products undergo processing. The value of annual harvest and post-harvest losses of major agricultural produce in India is of the order of $14 billion especially due to the lack of cold storages and cold chains. These are just some examples of business opportunities for U.S. companies in India. For a country with historical and tourist attractions in abundance, we have very low numbers of quality hotel rooms. This is another major opportunity for investors. U.S. companies which manufacture products in India will find a ready market in the countries of the subcontinent and beyond. The similarity of cultures will make it easier to sell these products to 450 million people in the Sark region and potentially many millions more in the countries to the west and east. India is a $2.45 trillion economy and is among the world's fastest growing economies. Foreign companies, especially from US, US and Europe, tend to focus on the 400 million strong middle class with living standards comparable with those of the west who can afford their goods. But there is also a 900 million strong less economically well endowed population, which is highly aspirational, who cannot be ignored for long. Urban and rural development and employment guarantee programs, as well as a rigorous push by the government to facilitate development and development of basic amenities, agriculture, food processing, and small and medium enterprise enterprises, is changing and transforming the face of India. Disruptive digital technologies are further facilitating this process. Corporates and NGOs are beginning to see this change and to recognize the economies of scale, which could be very lucrative. The effort is directed at bringing in smart villages, communities empowered by digital technologies and open innovation platforms to access global markets, which must be scalable and sustainable. The technologies are spread across the spectrum of developmental activities. They include IoT solutions for precision agriculture, telemedicine and water purification, e-commerce for goldsmiths, potters, fisher folk, weavers, yield enhancement for marine products, food processing and cold storage, and resurrecting dead paddy fields with digital technologies. Other key technologies include packaged sewage treatment plants and cold storage facilities. The technologies and adaptation will vary from village to village, as will the needs and requirements of the constituents. The sky is the limit. There are 640,000 villages all over India. The margins may be small, but the technology is scalable 
And when you realize that the product manufactured by corporates can potentially reach 900 million people, the returns look very attractive. We hope the India-US partnership will help energize and transform our manufacturing, power and connectivity infrastructure, together with improving water supply and waste management, agriculture, nutrition, and healthcare. The new paradigm can truly be a game changer for India, the US, and the world. I thank you.